Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English. And our objective for the hour now is to spend some time with several poems, short poems. The first uh, two offerings from the great American poet Gwendolyn Brooks. We're on page 1232, 1233, 34. We'll be looking now at two poems. The first one, Life for My Child, is simple. And what I want to do is give a brief schemata. We'll talk a little bit just briefly about the poem, listen to the poem, read professionally, and then we'll come back to make some observations about it. Let's first of all begin by making the observation that by the time the civil rights movement is fully underway in America, the great challenges for African Americans have a lot to do with what we will call generational issues. Generational issues. You'll want to put that in your notes. Generational issues. What do I mean when I use that term, generational issues? Well, one generation had lived a life as an African American one way. For example, not able to vote, not given any kind of respect by virtue of skin color. But the second generation, the children of those people, were growing up in a transitional time. Parents, collectively, had a lot of concern about the future. Would things be better or would things be worse? And what does it mean to raise a child who knows that that child might have to live in a bad world, in a world where lots of prejudice exists? Gwendolyn Brooks is going to play that game now. Let's go ahead and look at it. I'm with you on 1232. I want you to jot down in your notes while you're listening to this poem, what do you think, if, from this poem, what do you think is going to be the hardest challenge for kids growing up, according to the mother who's speaking? All right, so a mom is speaking in this poem. Here we go. Child is simple, Gwendolyn Brooks. You are about to read two poems by Gwendolyn Brooks. <laughs> Life for my child is simple and primer for blacks. In both of these poems, Brooks explores the ways in which people define themselves. Read along to hear Brooks's poetic opinions and advice. Life for my child is simple and is good. He knows his wish, yes, but that is not all, because I know mine too. And we both want joy of undeep and unabiding things, like kicking over a chair, or throwing blocks out of a window, or tipping over an icebox pan, or snatching down curtains, or fingering an electric outlet, or a journey, or a friend, or an illegal kiss. No, there is more to it than that. It is that he has never been afraid. Rather, he reaches out and lo, the chair falls with a beautiful crash, and the blocks fall down on the people's heads, and the water comes slushing sloppily out across the floor, and so forth. Not that success for him is sure and fallible, but never has he been afraid to reach. His lesions are legion, but reaching is his rule. Now, let's ask a simple question. In this poem, the mother hopes for something for her, for her child coming, right? What is it that she hopes for for her child? Write it down. What is it? And give a specific reference in, from the poem. What is it that she hopes for? Say it again. He's not a uh, be, be more specific in regards to what happens from the poem. Notice she says... Life for my kid is simple, and it's good. He knows his wish. Yes, but that's not all, because I know mine too. We both want joy of undeep and unabiding things. Like, this is a simile, what are some of the things that she kind of enjoys that her child can do? Are you ready for this word? Thoughtlessly. No, you're not reading the poem close enough, Hernandez. Keep reading now. Like? like uh, no, no, Hernandez, you're not reading the poem, though. Read the poem at line five. Like? What? Tipping what are simple things that her child can do? Little silly things. Tipping chairs over. Tipping chairs. If you've ever been around a kid, kid does this kind of stuff. 
throw stuff, okay. knock stuff over, tip stuff over. Good. Make, a, make a list for yourself. Throwing blocks out of a window, um, ripping over an ice pan box, uh, tipping over an ice pan box, uh, snatching down curtains, messing around with a finger. Kids, infants, will play around an outlet. Why? What don't they know? They don't know to fear. Fear what? Yeah, they don't know to fear electric shock can kill them. In other words, she's pleased about the fact that at this point in her son's life, he has absolutely no fear. He does whatever he wants, right? And he enjoys doing those things, right? Or a journey, or a friend, or an illegal kiss. Obviously, she's already imagining as her boy gets older, right? And starts to do things without thinking about them because the kid feels safe. Then she uses the word no, line nine. I'm teaching you how to read close, aren't I? There's more to it than that. In other words, life isn't just about growing up doing whatever you want, is it? Right? So, for example, if I were to ask you right now, where else would you rather be? You could give me a number of answers outside of 303. The obvious question is, dude, why aren't you there? And the obvious answer to that is because I made a choice. This is a choice that I've made in part with other adults around me to say, yeah, for a while, I'll do this thing called sitting in 303. But sooner or later, I'm out of here. To do what? Well, this is now the, the thought for her about her son's future. Keep reading. There's more to it than that. It is that he's... There it is, Hernandez. Do you see it? Line 11. Never been afraid. See, when you're a young, young infant, you don't know about all the bad stuff that can happen in your life. Right? You just live your life. You do what you want to do. You don't have to worry about being afraid, being scared. Rather... He reaches out and lo, the chair falls with a beautiful crash. The blocks fall down on people's heads. Water comes slushing across. In other words, anything he wants to do, he just does it. He's got no sense whatsoever of danger. What's she seeming to suggest about the future, though? What about fear? Sooner or later, can you live forever completely ignorant of fear? But why? Why? Because you got to what? You got to grow up, don't you? Right? Jot down in your notes, what is the relationship between growing up and encountering fear? Some of you will remember your freshman year of high school, where you were really excited about it, but you also had some deep reservoir of worry or anxiety about it. The night before you started high school that evening, you were lying in bed on the one hand really excited. Well, at least I'm not going into eighth grade middle school anymore. But on the other hand, there were questions because when you're in eighth grade, you run the place. When you're in ninth grade, you don't. And there's this kind of realization that you are stepping into a completely unknown experience where True, you can have lots of fun, but you can also be damaged. You can be hurt. But let's point out, most of you, the night before you started high school, didn't know how you could be hurt. <coughs> you were like this child. You didn't know how you could be hurt. It's like one of my juniors once said, I shot my mouth off a lot when I was in eighth grade. I said what I wanted, and I didn't care what people thought about it. Then I came to high school. And my first week in high school, I shot my mouth off a lot. I didn't care what anybody thought. And then I discovered there are ways people can hurt you in high school without you ever knowing about it. I shot my mouth off. I turned around and walked away. And they talked about me. They said things about me. They hurt my reputation. I had no idea people would do that to me or could do that to me. In other words, I had to grow up. There's like two lives you get to live. Life one, when you're very young. Life two, as you start to age. Of course, this begs a really intriguing question when you're 25 days away from being seniors. What will that be like? 
See? And again, you have the same kind of, well, on the one hand, at least I don't have to come back and be a junior all over again. Whew. On the other hand, you now realize you're at, you're at the end of this project. And now all of a sudden, in 300 days from now, people will be demanding of you, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? Think about how different that was from last year. Last year as a sophomore, you desperately wanted out of this place, but at least you knew 365 days from now, I'll still be sitting here. 365 days from now, you'll still be sitting here. The only difference will be not for much longer. And then you don't get to come back ever, ever again. You don't get to come back. You're not the same person, even if you decide to go ahead and bail on all your classes and fail so that you don't have to graduate, so you don't have to grow up. Guess what? You're still not the same. There's no getting out of it. You have to grow up. And in the process of growing up, obviously meeting, lots of, lots of pain. Adults know what kids don't. She finishes, not that success for him is sure, infallible, but never has he been afraid to reach. She hopes for her boy, what? Jot down in your notes. What does she want for him? She wants him to be successful. She hopes that he will forever have confidence, that he will forever be a confident person, right? This is an interesting question, though, and I think it's an interesting 3B question. And now's the time to start asking it. To what degree are you a different person than you were when you were a freshman? Now, I know that if we look at pictures of you from school, immediately we'll identify you look different. No doubt, physically you've changed. But what have you done in terms of, how have you changed in terms of other things? For example, do you feel like you're more confident now than you were 24 months ago when you were a freshman? Do you feel like you have a better idea of where you're going in your future than you did 24 months from now? See, some juniors will say, dude, I really do. I feel like I have a better idea. Other juniors will report, oh, I don't know about that. When I was a freshman, I had all these plans. I was going to do this and this and this and this. And this. Now, dude, I'm just trying to get out of high school. And if you ask me what it is I'm going to do after I get out of high school, that has a lot to do with things like money and time. And I don't know a lot about that right now. And what will my senior year be like in regards to that? Like, question, how do you know what you're supposed to be when you grow up? Does it come to you some night, late at night, lying in your bed, all of a sudden it hits you? Oh, that's what I'm going to be. Or is it some kind of gradual dawning that happens for you? And at what point do you have to make up your mind? Like, when do I know for sure? And then the other interesting question, no matter how concerned you are about it, the adults in your life are more concerned than you are. Why? Jot down why. Why would the people who are responsible for you be more concerned about your future than right now you are? They've been there, right? This is the point of this poem. See, all that kid knows is what that kid's doing right now. Does this make sense, Braxton? Adults have been there. They know what the 20s are like. See, that's the funny thing. I can ask Logue all day long, what's it like to be 20? And all he can tell me is what he thinks it's going to be like. He doesn't know. But ask his dad, and his dad will say, I can tell you what 20's like. That's why you better listen to me. See, it's kind of interesting, though. Right now, if you go down to middle school, and you try and talk to a bunch of sixth graders about high school, they do what? Well, they do what? You start talking, hey, I need to tell you about what high school's about. What do they do? Roll their eyes. Why do they roll their eyes? They know. They, they don't need you telling them what school. They know everything. They're sixth graders. Just like you knew everything when you were in sixth grade. You don't believe me. Ask the adults who are in charge of you. And that's the one thing they'll say. Dude, by sixth and seventh grade, you were so cocky. You thought you knew everything about the world and you didn't need to hear anybody else's advice. Some of you will say, that's funny. Adults are saying that to me right now. That's only because you're not 20 yet. When you turn 20 and enter your 20s, the world changes. Jot down at 3B. How do you think the world will change in, in 24 months for you? What will be your major concerns in 24 months? In what, what will be your major concerns? Right away, what do you think it will be, Hunter? 24 months from now, you ain't in high school. So what's your number one concern? Money. 
money, right? Right now, you most of you, right now, go into your kitchens, you open up cupboards and the food that's there, you didn't put it there. In fact, a good number of you don't even know how it got there. You don't care how it got there, you just know that it's there. Or it's if it's not there, you got somebody to yell at. Dude, where's the milk? What's going on? In 24 months, you got nobody to yell at in terms of that. You got to find your own way, so economically speaking. We're not done though, what else? Economics, what else? You got to have a roof over your head. Some of you in 24 months will still be quote unquote allowed to live at home. But let's be fair, at some point, some adult's going to look you in the eye and say, honey, I love you and all, but you got to get out of here. It's called your life, not our life. Goodbye. That's coming. And you know that's coming whether you want it or not. It's coming. It's inevitable. And of course, a roof over your head, again, costs money, right? And the obvious question is, where am I going to get it? We could say transportation issues, housing issues, clothing issues, food issues, but that's all economics. Come up with some other answers. What's some other issues? What do you think, Tashima? What else comes to mind? Yeah, obviously your education. See, here's the thing. You go to high school. Are you ready for this? You go to high school because that's what they told you in eighth grade you had to do. But you go to college if you go to college because that's what you get to do. It's a whole different project. That book that's sitting in front of you at college will cost you 150 of your dollars to buy. You got to buy it. Nobody gives you a book in college. You buy your books. And for all of your classes for one semester, you're dropping close to $1,000 in books. Who's going to pay for that? You are. You are. Why am I going to college? So I can get a degree. Why do I need a degree? So I can get a job. Why do I need a job? So I can get a career. See, think about this. You can get a job without a college degree. You can hardly ever get a career without a college degree. What's the difference? What's the difference? Because you get paid in both. You get paid in a job and you get paid in a career. What's the difference? In a career, you get paid more over time, don't you? Of course, our theory is, if I got to do a job, I'd like for it to be a career I really want. Well, there's a difficult question. How do I know what I want? How do I know what I'm good enough to do? Some of us will say, I really would like a career in this or that, but am I good enough to do it? Am I capable of doing it? I don't know that. I'm not sure about that. This poem assumes all those kinds of concerns and worries. Question, uh, dude, before we started class, none of these questions were on my mind. Now you've raised them all, thanks very much. Is it a good thing or a bad thing to already in our end of our junior year be thinking about that? What do you think, Braxton? Should we be thinking about this? Or should we just live now having a good time and not worrying about it? What do you think, Braxton? Why think about it? Why think about it? It upsets me to think about it. Because I've got all the answers, so I don't want to think about it. Because it's the rest of your life. You ain't got no choice, do you? It's coming. Tick tock, tick tock. It's coming. Whether you want to admit it or not, it's coming. All right, let's take a look at Gwendolyn Brooks' uh, Primer for Blacks. Now, this is a different kind of poem, so let's go ahead and set it up, and well, then we'll listen to it. In this poem, Brooks is responding to the challenges of racism. So let's define racism real quickly. What do I mean, Logue, when I use that term racism? Discriminate on the virtue of? race or skin color. You got it. Now, she writes a poem for African American readers that she knows white readers are going to read. I'll say that again. It's important for your notes. She writes a poem for African Americans, but she knows white Americans will be reading this poem. She calls her poem Primer for Blacks. Here, by the way, for your notes, Primer means lesson, teaching. She wants to say something to African Americans, and this is what she wants to say. Be proud. 
Be proud of your skin color. Don't wish somehow for another color of skin. Be proud of your skin color. Even if it isn't white, be proud of it. In the process, she will say to African American readers, you should never let any white person make you feel lesser because of your skin color. All right, let's take a look and listen to it. This is primer for blacks. Follow it along. Again, we're trying to improve our reading, aren't we? Primer for Blacks, Gwendolyn Brooks. Blackness is a title, is a preoccupation, is a commitment blacks are to comprehend and in which you are to perceive your glory. The conscious shout of all that is white is, it's great to be white. The conscious shout of the slack in black is, it's great to be white. Thus all that is white has white strength and yours. The word black has geographic power, pulls everybody in. Blacks here, blacks there, blacks wherever they may be. And remember, you blacks, what they told you. Remember your education. One drop, one drop maketh a brand new black. Oh, mighty drop. And because they have given us kindly so many more of our people, blackness stretches over the land. Blackness, the black of it, the rust red of it, the milk and cream of it, the tan and yellow tan of it, the deep brown, middle brown, high brown of it, the olive and ochre of it. Blackness marches on. The huge, the pungent object of our prime out ride is to comprehend, to salute, and to love the fact that we are black, which is our ultimate reality, which is the lone ground from which our meaningful metamorphosis, from which our prosperous staccato, group or individual can rise. Self-shriveled blacks begin with gaunt and marvelous concession. You are our costume and our fundamental bone. All of you, you colored ones, you Negro ones, those of you who proudly cry, I'm half Indian, those of you who proudly screech, I've got the blood of George Washington in my veins. All of you, you proper blacks, you have blacks, you wish I weren't blacks, niggeros and niggerines, you. Jot down right away, what is shocking about this poem to you? Go ahead, jot it down. What's one thing about this poem that shocks you? Because Gwendolyn Brooks, don't make no mistake, she meant to shock you. She did. She, she writes a poem that is intended to make you go, whoa, 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 what did I just read? What, what do you find most shocking about this poem, Stevens? Is there something about this poem you find kind of remarkable or shocking? The words she uses. In what way? She uses some very controversial language in this poem, doesn't she? Right? She, why do you think she uses the N-word in the way that she does? She's proud of it. In that regard, it's been slung at her as an insult. Now, this is an interesting question. Can you take insults and turn them around to be compliments? Mm -hmm. Jot down in 3B a way you've ever done that in your life. One time, somebody made fun of you, said something they thought was a really nasty thing about you, and you turned it around as a compliment in your mind. You heard what they said. You knew they were trying to be mean or hurt you. And instead of listening to it, you saw it as a compliment. In fact, whether you said it out loud or not, you went, thank you very much. I appreciate your saying that to me. Finally, why do you think it's hard to sometimes be proud of who you are? Why do you think that's so hard? Why is it hard to not want to be like somebody else instead of being who you are? No matter what your skin color, no matter whether you're a guy or a girl, 
no matter whether you're rich or poor, why is it that we have tendencies, do you think, Oz, to want to be somebody other than who we are? I, not all of us, but some of us. Why do you think that's the case? Do you think it's true high school is flooded with kids who want to be something and other what they are? Why? Why can't we be content with who we are and what we are? We start to feel insignificant, challenged in some way by other people. Why is fitting into the group so important, do you think? Why is not being laughed at so important? What do you think, Hunter? Why is that? I've had juniors that will say, if somebody or a group of my pals laughs at me, I will actually change the way I'm doing something. But why? Why should it matter? What do you think, Hernandez? Why? I mean, why wouldn't you say, dude, I do what I do. You don't like it. I don't care. You can laugh away. We think that we can do that, but what? Yeah, the minute, the minute they start laughing, it affects us. But why? Like, why should we care? Because, I mean, let's be fair. If a third grader started laughing at you about something you did, how would you respond? Yeah, right. That look Tashima has right there. Dude, are you serious? I really don't care what you... So why is it any different if a senior makes fun of you? So what? That's my question. Obviously, a senior is your peer. Why should it matter, though, what other people think of you? Say it out loud, Barnard. Why do they have power? What power does a senior have over you that's more power than a third grader? They can, what we were talking about before, huh? They can hurt you, can't they? They can make fun of you, but in what ways can they hurt you? They can only hurt you if you allow it to hurt you. How though mentally? They can hurt you mentally, but only if you allow it. So for example, somebody makes fun of you. How does that actually hurt you? I've had juniors that say, dude, I've never really thought about this. I just naturally assumed that it hurts you. What do you think, Eudine? How can it hurt you? So somebody makes fun of you. You say, that hurts me. Why does it hurt you? They haven't physically done anything to you. Feelings. They hurt your feelings. They hurt your pride. But don't you have to allow for that to happen? Depends on how confident you are. Ah, Stevens has given us a really important tie-in to this poem, huh? Primer for blacks is an invitation to grow some confidence. Question. Why is it children, young children, have so much confidence? They do anything they want. They say anything they want. But by the time, they're not afraid. But by the time we get to be juniors in high school, we seem to lack confidence. But why do we lack confidence? Did somebody come in and take it out of you? No. Where does it go? Why do we let it go? And at what point in your life did you stop being so confident, do you think? Was it in elementary school? Was it in middle school? Was it in early high school? Was it when you started to struggle to do certain things in school? Was it when you first failed something? Maybe you took a class and you didn't do very well in it. And then you felt dumb and the kids maybe made fun of you. Maybe it was your first time you were made fun of for your skin color or for your uh, socioeconomics. A junior once reported, I never knew I, there was anything wrong with me until I went to my first day of sixth grade, walked into class, and one of the rich girls made fun of what I had on. And for the first time in my life, it hit me, I, I wore clothes that had been given to me. I couldn't afford, my mom couldn't afford clothes. And for the first time, the thing that I had thought of was a cool thing, I get to wear my older sister's clothes, 
became an insult. Dude, you can't buy new clothes. You've got to wear old clothes. And for the first time, she said, I began to doubt myself. I was totally confident until that moment. But question, all of us have stories like that. When does that stop for you? Because, hello, are you ready for this? It seems to me, I'm saying it, get, it gets dark at night, obvious kind of statement. It seems to me you're always going to have people in your life that can have power over you if you allow them to. Would you agree with me? You're always going to have people in your life who are older than you, smarter than you, better looking than you, who can make fun of you. You're always going to have that in your life, aren't you? I mean, you're always going to have that in your life, right? And no matter how handsome you think you are, or how powerful you think you are, you're probably going to run across somebody someday who's going to go, really? That's the best you've got. Right? And she might even be beautiful. Uh-oh. And then what's Tashima going to do? Be forever alone. 